learning refers to the process of changing your knowledge or behavior because of your experience. Okay, so whether you learn something because you listened in lecture, because you saw somebody else doing something and figured it was the right thing to do, because you touched something hot and got burned, learning is the idea that you changed because of your experience. Cats have instincts like chasing things that are not learned. They're programmed to do that. Okay. If there was a cat and Carlton was here, we go after that. It's not a learned response. We don't have to teach a cat to do that. We just do it because it's programmed into them. That's not what learning is about. Although learning does depend on our biological capacities. We're more prepared to learn some things than, than others. Maybe you can't teach a cat to read. I could train you to chase my laser pointer. So learning is about changing your knowledge or behavior because of your experience. The changing your behavior part doesn't require cognition. So learning can be studied at a purely behavioral level without invoking higher processes of cognition. As the scientist, as the objective observer, I could just watch your behavior, see that you did something differently, and conclude that you learned. Behaviorists would say, I don't need to, to know what you're thinking. And very, very simple creatures can learn. They have very simple processes for learning that apply to animals with very simple brains and that even apply to people who are unconscious. So one of those simple processes is called habituation. There's a fan in this room. You might have stopped noticing because it just isn't important to notice it. Right? There's no point in spending calories noticing that. That's habituation. So if a stimulus occurs and it's not important, to stop paying attention to it. And that helps you conserve your attention. But if the stimulus is threatening, <clears throat> you can become sensitized to it. And you'll notice it more and more each time it happens. In that case, it, it's adaptive to be sensitized because it's somehow threatening or irritating. I can, um, sometimes I can't seem to hear what you're saying when you're talking to me, but I, I notice whispers very well and I'm sensitized to that. So learning can happen at a very low level without conscious awareness. And if you shoot that sea slug with a jet of water, it could track. Okay, just like you'd startle if I made a sudden noise. But if you kept doing that, it wouldn't react the same way. Okay, that's an example of learning. Okay, the sea slug changed its behavior because of its experience. So learn that being sprayed with water is just no big deal. Okay, and sea slugs don't have much in the way of, of a brain or consciousness. But you can also learn in, in a very explicit way when you're studying or when you're listening, then you're learning in, in a way that you're conscious of your learning. But you, like the sea slug, can, can also learn implicitly. Sometimes first year students are, are worried about finding their way through buildings, finding their way through campus. Will you be able to get from one side of campus to the other? Okay. And actually, if you just wander around campus, you will implicitly learn spatial location. And then you don't have to be aware, really aware of that. You're not trying to memorize it. Then next time you try to get somewhere, you'll be able to pull that out and you'll get there faster. 
So you can learn both ex explicitly, consciously, and implicitly or unconsciously. One way we learn is by making associations. That's a fundamental way we learn. It's by making associations between stimuli, between stimuli and behaviors. Here's an example. Let's say that loud thunder startles you. Before you hear the thunder, you see lightning. And so you might startle as soon as you see the lightning without hearing the thunder yet. And what happens there is that you have learned to respond to a stimulus that predicts an important stimulus. It's one that you have a, a natural reaction to. And it's adaptive to notice what, what predicts is that, okay? Can you give me another example of that kind of learning? Can you think of one? Learning to associate a response to a stimulus that predicts the stimulus that you'd normally be responding to. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And what happened in, in that example? I'm not going to go Yes. So what happened in that famous example is that Ivan Pavlov was a Russian digestive researcher. He was a researcher who studied the digestive system, and he won a Nobel Prize for doing that. And he would put meat powder in the dog's mouths. And based on his understanding of how digestion worked at the time, he figured that salivation is a response that the dog should have in to the meat powder. Right? You put meat powder in the mouth and the dog should salivate. That's what he figured. But that wasn't what happened. What actually happened was that the dogs started salivating as soon as they heard the researcher's footsteps in the hallway. Because the sound of the footsteps predicted the feeding. And that's an example of classical conditioning. We can also learn through consequences. Okay. We act in ways that get us the things that we want, and we avoid doing things that hurt us. That's called operant behavior. You're here in this class because you're going to get some reward for it, right? There wasn't going to be a grade on your transcript, none of you be here. And then if I tell you not to do something, let's say, and it's something late, and you do it, I could punish you by giving you a zero. And then maybe you won't do something. <laughs> so the behavior that gets you something that you want is called an operant behavior. Asking your crush out on a date is an operant because you're hoping to achieve something by doing that. But respondent behavior as associated with classical conditioning just refers to your natural reaction. So maybe flinching at the sight of the lightning or salivating to food. That's a response. That's respondent behavior. 
Operant behavior is intentional, not automatic. We also learn by acquiring mental information. We learn by thinking and by listening and by reading. And you can also learn by watching what happens to other people. If you see somebody get burned doing something, maybe you won't do that. You've already brought up the example of, of Pavlov and his dogs. And this famous set of experiments, Pavlov was able to train dogs to salivate to a tone. The whole bell thing is a mistranslation. Salivate to tone. Food is what we call an unconditioned stimulus. That the dog has a natural, unconditioned, untrained response to. And that response is salivation. From the point of view of what this researcher is interested in studying, which is salivation, the tone is a neutral stimulus because a, a dog wouldn't naturally react to a tone by salivating. A natural response might be pricking up his ears and turning his head and attending to it, but we're not interested in that. From the point of view of the behavior that we're interested in, the salivation, the tone is a neutral stimulus. Now, let's say we have some trials in which we present the tone and then present the food. The dog probably won't react to the tone alone the first time, but let's say you do that about 20 times. Now, when you just present the tone with no food, the dog would salivate to the tone. And so the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. That's the process of classical conditioning. For this to work, now you want to present the food immediately after sounding the tone, not like three days later, then the dog wouldn't learn. You want to present the tone before the food and not after, because after the dog sings the food doesn't care about the tone anymore. So the, the value of learning this is in the tone being a reliable predictor of the food. John Watson was a, a famous behaviorist who was influenced by Pavlov. And he demonstrated something called stimulus generalization in a famous experiment with his graduate student and later wife, Rosalie Rayner. And that's the, the little Albert experiments. Anyone familiar with it? Yeah, I'm going to throw, throw this at you this time. I forgot about it. So what happened in the little Albert experiment? Um, they presented to little Albert a white rat. And how did he white react mouse. to rat the first time? Uh, he was just curious. Yeah, no big deal. Trying to play with it. But then they presented the rat and really loud noise uh, pretty much at the same time. So they, they bashed some yeah. a bar behind his head. Yeah. But what did that make him do? Uh, he started to get like react over the rat because he thought the rat was a condition stimulus in a way. So every time they showed him the rat, they mm -hmm. made the loud noise. And what did, and what did he do? How did he react <laughs> to the noise? Uh, he got startled, pretty much. So he got startled or cried or something like that. Yeah. Um, but then the thing is that they also presented other things. Just like skipping ahead. So he cries to the sound, the loud sound. And then in the next one, what happens when they show him the rat now? He cries also. Okay, so he cries at the rat. 
and and okay go on <laughs> uh by the end of the experiment uh he started to cry and get startled with um other white fluffy things like bunnies even uh, a fake beard yeah so they show him other white fluffy things including i think uh, <clears throat> the researcher's head um and uh as he said a santa mask and so he cried when he saw those because they reminded him of the rat and that is an example of a phenomenon called stimulus generalization the little albert generalized his response to the rat and other fluffy things now let's see if we can figure out what from that experiment was the neutral stimulus the unconditioned stimulus the unconditioned response the condition stimulus call that the cr and the un no, the condition sorry condition stimulus and the condition response and we figure out what those were Conditioned response was crying. Yes, crying is a conditioned response. And the conditioned stimulus would be white fluffy thing? Yeah, so it's the rat plus white fluffy things. And then neutral stimulus would be the rats again. The pre yes, the rat preconditioning. Because after conditioning, the neutral stimulus becomes the conditioned stimulus. Yes. Unconditioned stimulus would be the loud noise. Yes. Excellent. And what's his unconditioned response to that? Yeah. I have a setup like this on the quiz. Good job. Um, Watson believed that human behavior can dis consists of conditioned responses. And he thought that the goal of the science of psychology is the control of behavior. And we do this through appropriate conditioning. And he had some way of applying this to child raising. Uh, he had a quite a strict authoritarian parenting style, lots of rules. Um, both his sons uh, that he had with Rosalie Rayner developed depression and attempted suicide, one of them successfully. And one of them wrote a book and said that they felt that his child raising practices impaired their, abil their ability to deal with human emotions. That's anecdotal. Maybe it was that, maybe it was something else, but it goes to show that you can have a, a great psychologist who does some great research and then also really messes up with something else. The field of behaviorism took the position that psychology should be an objective science that studies behavior without reference to mental processes. And we don't need to know what little Albert is thinking to understand that. Do away with, with that. Behaviorism is one perspective in psychology that was popular you know, mid-century and before that, but it has been replaced now, right? There was a cognitive revolution in psychology. So we think your thoughts are important now.
Oops. So little Albert learned to generalize his fear of rats to other white fluffy things. I imagine how far you could take that. Would he have been afraid of yellow fluffy things? At some point, the generalization stops. And then you have discrimination. And discrimination refers to the learned ability to distinguish between a condition stimulus and other irrelevant stimuli. So Pavlov's dogs would salivate to a tone and they'd salivate to other similar tones, but there could be sounds that they wouldn't salivate to because they're too different from what they learned to salivate to. So that's a different use of the word discrimination than say unfair social discrimination. In this case, it means to notice that there's a difference. Here's another example of discrimination. So he originally trained dogs to, I'm sorry, he originally trained dogs to salivate to a tone, but in another set of experiments, he put a, a buzzer on their body, okay? So the buzzer would go off on the dog's thigh before it got fed. And so the dogs learned to salivate when the buzzer went off. You can see how much saliva they produced. And you can see how much fun it is to be a research assistant. Do things like collect saliva and measure it in milliliters. Um, but then he tried moving it around. Okay, what happens if you put it on their hind paw? Right, try that, see how much they salivate. Well, it's less. And basically, as you got further and further away, right, to the front paw, they salivated less and less. Okay, that's an example of, of discrimination. And this is a good example of, of psychology as a science. He has a theory, he's testing it empirically, and you're, you're measuring something really objective. It is possible to condition a response to a stimulus that predicts the condition stimulus. Yeah, that's quite a thought. But let's say you train a dog to salivate to a tone. Well, what if you shone a light before you played the tone? Can you train the dog to salivate to the light? Yes but not as much. Here's an example of condition stimuli, words. Words represent things. You have reactions to words, trauma triggers. You have really strong reactions to those. Right, those are condition stimuli or higher order condition stimuli. But that relationship tends to get weaker and weaker. I wonder about the money. If you're happy, you find a dollar bill on the ground. Well, why would you care? It's just a piece of paper. But it's associated with nice things learn over your life that you can get nice things for money. Now let's say that you kept playing the tone, but you stopped giving food. What would you expect to happen then? Sound the tone and now no food is presented. Yes. Eventually, after like doing that for a really long time, the dog would probably stop salivating, but it would take a lot, lot for the like, Eventually, they will. Yeah, that's called extinction. They'll stop. Um, extinction can be made to happen faster or slower if you had the dog on a continuous reinforcement schedule every time they heard the sound 
they ate, there was food, and then you stop cold, that will extinguish much more quickly than say, if you had the dog on a partial reinforcement schedule. And let's say you were only um, giving it food some of the time. Partial reinforcement schedules are more resistant to extinction. Yes. Here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this to you. Since we have people on Zoom today. It's a good term. If you changed like the, the stimulus to, to like, if you, instead of using that tone, you use some sort of different thing to, I don't know, to condition food, would that make it ex like change quicker? If that makes sense? Like, like if he used a different stimulus, like let's say instead of using a tone, we um, shone a light. Yeah. Like if you replaced one stimulus with another stimulus, would that like make it quicker for the original, the original sound to stop triggering the salivation response? Or is that not how that works? I have no clue. Just, like you're the sounding thing. like let's now let's train the dog to respond yeah. to a light. Yeah, you give it like a new thing. Would that like take its mind off of it? Is that not how that works? Like do you know what I mean? have I don't know. I'm just that. curious. I don't know. All right. I'm okay. We did a good job. Um <laughs> extinction isn't the same thing as unlearning. It's not the memory being destroyed. Okay, so what happens in extinction is that the animal learns a new association. You learn that now this stimulus isn't predictive anymore. It's not important anymore. It doesn't work anymore. Okay, and that new learning just suppresses the old learning. So it's not about learning one thing and then unlearning it. It's more like learning two things that counteract each other. And we know this because of a phenomenon called spontaneous recovery. So the response can be extinguished and then suddenly pop up again. And this is particularly likely to occur in, say, a new context, right? Maybe in a new context, the dog hears the tone again and thinks, hey, maybe this time. And they respond to it. Actually, I take that back. They don't need to think at all. It's an automatic process. There are applica many applications of classical conditioning. A big one is in overcoming fears and phobias. So let's say somebody has a fear of spiders or fear of elevators and they get treatment for that. One kind of treatment is called systematic desensitization therapy. And the therapist will try to condition the feared stimulus, say a spider, to a response that's opposite from fear to relaxation. How would you do that? Has anyone ever had that kind of therapy? Maybe the first thing that the therapist would do is get, to get you relaxed, do some breathing exercise. And then we would start, start you thinking about spiders. You just say the word spider and that'll make you feel tense, you might respond a bit to that, but we'll work you back down again. And keep doing that to the point where you don't have a, a reaction to the word spider. And then we're gonna turn up the heat of it. Maybe we'll have you look at a picture of a spider. And that'll make you feel tense and we'll calm you back down. Keep doing that to the point that you're okay with looking at pictures of cartoon spiders. And then we'll step you up to scary looking spiders. And keep doing this process. You can get people to the point where they're all right with having like a tarantula on their hand. It's um, there's probably all kinds of legal issues with having tarantulas in your office and putting them on people. So these days, um, psychologists tend to use virtual reality therapy. So somebody would be in a virtual reality environment where there's spiders in the kitchen okay, and they're getting up close to them. People who get chemotherapy feel very sick afterwards. We have a predisposition to associate sickness with food, like a biological predisposition. And so what can happen is that people will start to associate the illness with whatever they ate before the chemotherapy. 
And then they don't want to eat their normal foods. And that's not going to help them stay strong. And so a way around this is to have a scapegoat. So something distinctive, something they don't really like or need to eat. Great lollipop. Have one of those before chemotherapy. And now the person will be conditioned to hate great, lo great lollipops. But that's okay. At least they're still eating their food. There's also a role for classical conditioning in, in understanding and treating um, addictions. Does anyone know what, what that is there? Disulfram. I know what disulfram does. It's a treatment for alcohol use disorder. People who take disulfram will feel very, very sick if they touch any amount of alcohol, like violently, horribly ill. Teaches you to associate alcohol with illness to the point that you don't even want to. It's not a cure-all. I mean, people know they're on it and they can stop taking it. Yes? Is it the same thing as Suboxone? Same thing as what? Suboxone. Suboxone. I don't know what Suboxone is. I haven't heard that. Um, it's a pill that you take you put on your job when you have like metal addiction. Okay. And does it, oh, and, and it makes you sick when it comes to many things. Oh, okay. So it's maybe the version of, of this medication, but for methamphetamine or amphetamines. Never heard of it. And we, we know there's a role of, of cognition even in classical conditioning because people who are on these drugs know they're on the drug and, and so they can decide to stop taking it. Okay, so it's not a purely unconscious process, though it can be. Cognition matters too. If you, your body has a counter-regulatory response to drugs that affect it. Okay, so let's say alcohol depresses the nervous system. Your nervous system learns that. Okay, and so you develop a physiological tolerance. It learns to fight back. That counter-regulatory response is conditioned to the environment that the drug is used in. Before you drink alcohol, there are probably all kinds of environmental cues that suggest that the alcohol is coming. You know, going to the NSLC, right? being in a bar, and that's the same thing for, for other drug users, okay? Addicts who die of an overdose usually took the same dose, took their usual dose. I mean, they know their way around dosing right? in a new environment where they haven't used it before. And so the counter-regulatory response wasn't all there. And what was the normal dose became an overdose. One of the reasons that rehab doesn't always work is that people learn to be sober in that new and very distinctive environment of the rehabilitation center. It's not what it's like at home. Okay, When they come home to their apartment and they see all the cues that were associated with using there, they like that's the pushy armchair that they sat on while injecting. And I'll see that. And then expect and crave the high. So it can be best if people coming out of rehab move into a new place instead of going back to the, the old place. On to operant conditioning. Operant conditioning refers to learning from consequences. Operant conditioning is a voluntary intentional behaviors because you are living your life in a way that you're trying to get the rewards. If I get the nice things, the pleasant things, and avoid the nasty, unpleasant things. The law of effect is the principle that if a behavior is followed by a pleasant consequence, the frequency of the behavior will increase. 
And if a behavior is followed by an unpleasant consequence, then the frequency of that behavior will decrease. That is called the law of effect. Edward Thorndike studied this using what they called a puzzle box. Took a hungry cat and put the cat in a box that it had to learn to escape from. And the cats seemed to figure this out by trial and error. It was a nice piece of fish on the other side of the box that they're trying to get to. So they scramble around and do all kinds of things, turn around, twist around, and eventually somehow they would strike on the right mechanism to open the door, push a lever, I don't know what. And then Thorndike would have to put the cat back in the box and time how long it took the cat to get out of the box. And after about like 60 trials, the cat starts to get it. The cat's not learning by insight. It's trial and error learning. And the reward is stamping in the connection between the stimulus and, and the behavior of, let's say, the stimulus is the lever and the behavior is pushing the lever. The reward stamps in that connection. But it doesn't happen immediately. There is an acquisition period. A long one for cats. This is a lot of work for the researcher. It's watching the cats and taking notes. And so B.S. Skinner came up with something called the, the operant chamber. It's known as the Skinner box. And so you put an animal, usually a rat, into a box that has a lever, has a food dispenser, the elf has an electric grid that would deliver foot shocks. They don't like that. There'd be a speaker so that you could sound a tone. And then lights. Let's say you could have a, a red light and a green light. And maybe you could teach the animal to push the lever when the green light is on to get the food, but not to push it when the red light is on because then I'll get a shot. The big advance of the Skinner box is that you could just leave the lab and let the box record the behavior in terms of number of levels in response to whatever stimuli you were showing. Reinforcer is an important terminology important term in operant conditioning. A reinforcer is an outcome that strengthens the probability that, that increases the frequency of a response. If I, let's say I, I have a target behavior, I want you to study. If I do something and that makes you study more, then what I did was a reinforcer. Maybe it was giving you candy. Then candy is a reinforcer. It's a reinforcer because it increased the frequency of the behavior. If it didn't increase the frequency of the behavior, then it's not a reinforcer. Reinforcers can be positive or negative. What positive means? means that you add something. If I give you candy, that's positive reinforcement because I gave you something. Negative means that you took something away. How could I negatively reinforce you towards studying more? Yes. Would that include bad grades? Good question. Bad grade be like if it upsets you, if seeing a bad grade upsets you, then it's a positive punishment because I'm adding something. It's like, here's an app. 
right? You've been taught that S are bad. So that's positive in the sense that I applied something. For it to be negative reinforcement, I have to take something away. Distraction. Yeah, so let's say that you're annoyed by distractions and I promise, you know, I take away the distraction and I turn off the fan, right? Or I, I shush the people that are whispering and then you're like, okay, now I can stay. And the librarians do that be in the library. They keep it quiet for you. So yes, removing distractions. I think that's a good example of negative reinforcement. So reinforcement, if it worked to help you study more or to make you study more, and it's negative because I took something away. Another example of negative reinforcement is that, that seat belt tone in your car. So you get in your car, you turn it on to drive, and you have to put your seat belt on, and the government and the car manufacturers want you to wear a seat belt and it goes ding, 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 until you stop it by putting on your seat belt. That's negative reinforcement. So that alarm you have to turn off. Get out of bed to turn off your alarm. It's annoying you. That's re negative reinforcement towards getting up. Rats just don't walk up to levers and start pushing them. There's a process around getting a rat to push a lever. And so you use reinforcers, food works well, to get them to do that, maybe you start by reinforcing them when they're on the side of the cage that has a lever. If you keep doing that, they'll hang out more on that side of the cage. Then you're gonna have to up the ante a bit. Maybe you'll only reinforce the animal when it's near the lever. And so it'll start hanging out near the lever. And once it's doing that reliably, Maybe you'll only reinforce the rat once it touches the lever. Once you get it to that point, now you'll only reinforce the rat when it pushes the lever. So it takes a little while to get a rat to push a lever. And that process is called shaping. And it's used in training animals. So that dolphin would have been shaped to do that trick with the ball. A colleague of mine argues that a lot of our behavior is maintained on negative reinforcement schedules. So do you come to this class because you're really enjoying it or because you could be getting an app? Do you go to work because you really like working and need the money that much? or because you're afraid of getting fired. And it really is probably both. But there's a role for negative reinforcement and maintaining behavior. Do you cave into peer pressure because it's so wonderful to be included by those people or because you're afraid of the rejection? Primary reinforcers are innately reinforcing stimuli. Things like food and affection and sex. Food's the one we usually use. Then there are secondary reinforcers. These are actually conditioned reinforcers. And they have their power through their association with a primary reinforcer. Money is an example. Like money is just a piece of canvas. Why do you care about it so much? Because you know through experience that it's associated with primary reinforcers. You use it to buy groceries. Reinforcers can be immediate. You can provide it immediately after the behavior happens. Or they can be delayed. And it's actually harder to learn delayed associations, right? Harder to make decisions based on delayed associations. And the ability to do so is kind of a sign of intelligence. 
right. like delay of gratification is, is an important skill. There are different schedules of reinforcement. So you can continuously reinforce a response. Every time that the rat pushes the lever, it gets a food pellet. One press, one pellet, another press, another pellet, another press, another pellet. That's continuous reinforcement. And that's the reinforcement schedule that this vending machine would be on. Assuming it's not broken, you put your 25 cents in and you get your gut wall. What about that kind of vending machine? The scam, you say? Why? What's happening with that one? What do you? What's going on there? What's that? What's that machine doing to you? You put it in the money, or whatever you put in, and then you play with it. You you do your best, and you try to take it out, but like, like I went to Palladium for this, and um. <laughs> Like the thing was, yeah, see, I knew that. But still like, it's fun because you feel like you're going to get it. And so you, so you keep going. Yeah, it's like gambling. And so how much you spend on, on that little plushie at the end of the day is probably much more than it's worth. So that is a partial reinforcement schedule. And there's four different kinds of partial reinforcement schedules, which we'll go over next, and they result in, in different kinds of behaviors. So the reinforcement schedule can be based on a number of responses or a, number, a period of time after a response. Ratio reinforcement schedules are based on a number of responses. That can be fixed or variable. Fixed would mean that you will be reinforced after every five responses. The rat has to push the lever five times and exactly five times and only five times before it gets the pellet. So it gets the pellet at five and at 10 and at 15. Now you can make things a little harder for the rat by making that a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. You could say that it will get the reinforcer after an average of five lever presses. Maybe this time it's two, maybe that's time it's seven, but it works out to an average of five. So let's look at the graphs here. The graphs show the number of responses on the y axis and the number and the amount of time on the x-axis. And here we have a, a scalloped graph, okay? So it's like the rat kind of lets things level off a bit. It gets into its reinforcer, okay? It puts in five presses. One, two, three, four, five, done, okay? Maybe take a little break. You have another burst of activity, another five. You take a little break, see when where the graph is flat. It's not putting in any responses over time. You'll get another little burst. Okay, so it produces that kind of responding. Now what happens when we make it variable? How does that change the rat's behavior? Yes. It looks like, according to the graph, it just keeps on playing the odds to try and meet. It you does a lot more responses per time. Spent. Yeah, it goes nuts. It's like you with that machine, the palladium, because you don't know when you're going to get your prize. So you keep putting money into it. And you don't know how many times you have to do that before you finally get it. So you keep doing it. Interval schedules um, provide a reinforcer after a, an amount of time. 
And it can be an exact amount of time or a variable amount of time. So we could reinforce the rat after, for one response after five minutes, or for one response after an average of five minutes. And with a fixed interval reinforcement schedule, you get an interesting scalloped pattern. It's like the opposite kind of scallop from this one. And it's like the rat, it's flat at first. They're like, yeah, whatever, I'm not gonna do anything. And then before the five minutes are up, it's gonna put in its responses. Okay, it sort of, it procrastinates. And then before the time is up again, it'll respond. And you might have noticed something like this with your studying for quizzes. You know that the quizzes do Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Right? And they're usually available on Thursdays. Yet most students right, have not written it by like 10 p.m. Like you're you're going to not do it. And then right before the thing is due, put in your responding to get your reward. Interesting what happens when you make it um, an average out of amount of time. What would you do if, if I said, there will be a quiz every week, but I won't tell you when it is. It's a pop quiz. How would that influence your studying? I try, um, yeah, so you probably study more sooner, and you get a you get a smoother. It, it wouldn't have the scallop anymore, okay? Because the scallop is you anticipating when your responses are due, and then just doing them all before before it's due. But if it was a pop quiz and you didn't know it was coming, then you would study more consistently. I think we should do that could help improve your study habits. Mm -hmm. Apply psychology. No? Too much pressure. Too much pressure. Yeah, it could be more stressful. Um, the opposite of a reinforcer is a punisher. Okay? A punisher <laughs> is an outcome, an event that weakens the probability of a response, that decreases the frequency of a behavior. Okay? But it's not a punishment if the target behavior doesn't decrease. If I shush you and you keep whispering, well, then the shushing wasn't an effective punishment, is it? Okay, so it's a punisher, the punishment because it decreases the probability or the frequency of the target behavior. And just like reinforcement, positive punishment can be positive or negative. But since it's about getting you to stop doing something, we're going to have to use, according to the law of effect, an unpleasant stimulus, an unpleasant event. So we can add something unpleasant to create positive punishment. And an example of that might be squirting water on a cat. Your cat doesn't like water. And negative punishment is taking away something that you'd like. Can someone give me an example of negative punishment? Yes. Taking a phone away? Yeah, yeah, confiscating your phone. That's a good example. So if you like your phone and you're upset that I take it away from you, and as a result of that, you stop doing whatever it was I wanted you to stop doing, whispering. Then it was punishment, and it's an example of negative punishment. So it took away something you liked. But let's say that you didn't give two shits, right? Then it's just not a punishment anymore because it didn't do anything to change the target behavior. I still took something away, but it's kind of irrelevant now because it didn't work. Punishment does work, 
but it has its limitations. And so when the powers that be try to control your behavior, they use both reward and punishment. Punished behavior is suppressed. It's not forgotten. It's not unlearned. And so it doesn't, it doesn't tell you what you should go do. It says, don't do that. And sometimes people will learn to associate the punishment with the person that's giving it, or they'll associate it with a particular context. And so they'll learn that I can keep doing this, just not in front of that person. And so it can lead to subversive behavior and, and undermining. My mother is so proud of how she teaches cats to never jump on the counter. And the cats just never do that. She's taught them this so well. I remember one day I was at her place and I stayed up all night, probably working on some paper, and, and her cat was all over the counters. So the cat just waited until she was asleep and then did it. So while she taught the cat really not to walk on the counters in front of her. Okay. Um, punishment can also teach fear. And maybe the person that's being punished just learns to fear the parent or fear the teacher and not really understand why what they did was wrong so that they don't do it again. And it also models aggression as a way to cope with problems. We talk about um, these different kinds of conditioning as if, as if only one of them were going on at a certain time, but our experiences are more complicated than that. Right? If you have, you might have multiple forms of reinforcement punishment going on at the same time in order to control your behavior. So is somebody, is putting someone in jail negative or positive punishment? Maybe that question's a false dichotomy. But how could it be a positive punishment? How are you adding things that people don't like? Yes. Prison food? It's, it's said to be horrible. And this form of, of loaf is actually used as a kind of punishment for bad behavior. It's apparently quite effective. And what they do is they just throw everything into a blender. So potatoes, meat, margarine, breakfast cereal, jello, mustard blend it up and bake it into a loaf. And it's served without any condiments at all or any seasoning. And yeah, so that's an example of a, a positive punishment because people like hate eating that apparently. Um, and then how is it negative punishment? Yes. I'm taking them Yeah. All the things that they're free to bought them, their friends and the activities they like, yes. Also, like social isolation, like you can be present a lot of stress, pressure, being alone. And they have other cellmates, but I don't think that. Cellmates are positive punishment. So they might not like them. Yeah. Yes. So the negative punishment is taking away things you like, and the positive punishment is adding things that you don't like. Here's an, an application. So there's so many applications of operant conditioning that, that I couldn't list them all. It's going on all the time, right? You're, you're being operant conditioned in this class right now. Come here, do the readings, listen to the lecture, jump through the hoops. If you do that, then you'll get the credit, right? And maybe you'll also get a good grade that you could go use somewhere else, if that's the idea. And if you don't do it, then you're punished with, you know, say, the F and the fact that you lost like $2,000. Okay, so it's going on everywhere. You break the rules, you get a fine. Okay, you break the rules at work, you get fired. We use money to get people to do things. You use food to train your dog. Okay, so it's, ev it's everywhere, all around you. Here's an example it's called a, a token economy. And these use uh, operant conditioning to shape behaviors in usually in institutions where the psychologists have a lot more control. 
And so you'll see these in, in schools and um, in hospitals in prisons in, in homes with children. And basically the idea is that if, if you do what you're supposed to do, then you earn some kind of points and you can trade the points in for something that you want. And if you do things you're not supposed to do, then you'll lose points. And you can't get what you want from, from the prison store. When I was working on this slide presentation, my nine-year-old daughter came up to me and she wanted to know what I was doing. And so I explained this to her. And then she came up with this point system where I lose points for like looking at my phone and looking at my computer and you know giving her the wrong insulin and doing extra work for SMU. And and I can gain them by scratching her back or playing with her. And she's actually kept this going for a year now. And so I'm, I'm up to two points. I was recently down to, to minus 17. And I had to pay off the points. Like there's a due date for paying them off by like scratching her back for one minute. Key differences between operants and classical conditioning. So in classical conditioning, the target behavior is elicited automatically. Salivation to food, flinching at a noise or automatic responses. But operant conditioning is about voluntary behavior. The organism kind of decides to push a lever. Um, in classical conditioning, the behavior is a function of a stimuli that precedes the response. So if the response is, is salivation to a tone, the tone comes before salivation. <laughs> but in operant conditioning, it's about a consequence that comes after the behavior. And the autonomic nervous system is primarily engaged in classical conditioning, whereas it's the somatic nervous system and operant conditioning. Remember, the somatic nervous system controls your voluntary muscles. There are biological influence on learning such that we learn certain associations more easily than others. So at one point, psychologists thought that maybe stimuli were equipotential, all equally likely to become part of associations, but that's not the case. It's way easier to condition fear to a snake than to a tongue. People who have phobias tend to have phobias of things that would have been of, of importance to our ancestors, right? Snakes, not cars, heights, loud noises, other people, but not to modern things even though those modern things like planes are much more dangerous. Okay, so there's some form of biological preparedness for prepared to form certain associations more easily than others in a way that sort of makes sense from the perspective of evolutionary psychology. We're also more likely to form illusory correlations. It's an illusory correlation, I didn't teach you that. Uh, you may assume that two things are connected when they're really not because they occur together spontaneously. If a bad thing happened and you saw a snake, you're more likely to believe that the snake caused it than to believe that about some other object in the environment. We're especially likely to associate illness with food. Usually it takes quite a few trials to learn an association, like the one with Pavlov's dogs. That might be like 25 trials before they get that. You can have one shot conditioning. Maybe there's a time that you ate a certain kind of food and you got sick. And then you never want to eat that food again. That phenomenon tends to be highly localized to a specific food. It doesn't generalize to other similar foods very well. And if you get sick after, say, eating somewhere, you're likely to form the, the association with food and not with the um, the tablecloth or the curtains or um, the picture on the wall. You're biologically predisposed to associate illness and food. 
This is a famous experiment by Garsha and Kelling. What they did was they had two kinds of water, tasty water and bright noisy water. Tasty water is water with saccharin in it, water that has a taste. Bright noisy water means that when the animal drinks, the water is presented, there's also a light in its home. So they let the animals drink either the tasty water or the bright noisy water. And then they did one of two things. They either exposed the animal to x-rays, which made it feel sick, or they gave it foot shock. And these graphs show you how much water they drank pre-conditioning versus after conditioning. What do these graphs show you? What's going on there? Okay, so preconditioning. They're drinking about the same amount of water. You know, they're thirsty rats. They don't care if it's saccharin laced water or bright noisy water. Okay, that's pretty much the same. And then afterwards, they after the drinking of the water, they either get an X-ray or rats in another group get foot shock. And what changes about their drinking patterns after this? So they expose the rats to x-rays and then that makes them feel sick. And then they put them back in the cage with the water and they wanna see how much water they get. And they can drink flavor, tasty water or bright noisy water. This is probably done in four different groups but they don't have a choice between two options. So rats who got, so this graph here shows rats who are given the x-ray and they feel sick. It shows how much flavored water they drank and how much bright noisy water they drank. Does it look like they have a preference or that they're avoiding one and not the other? What are they doing? Yes, Alex. Water tasted funny and then they felt sick. And if I drank weird tasting water and then got sick, I assume that the weird flavored water did something. You're not so keen on drinking it when you're put back into the situation with water. Okay. So uh didn't seem to affect the bright, noisy water. They're drinking about just about as much as that as before. Then these rats got a foot shock. So post conditioning, what kind of water are they drinking more of? What kind of water are they avoiding? Drinking more of the, the same amount of the Label slightly less flavored water, but significantly less bright noisy. And could there be a reason for that connection? Would it be that because with flavored water there's an internal, but with the foot shock, all the stimuli were external? Well, with the like the, the x ray, they drank the flavored water, which they tasted. Whereas the chalk, it was noisy. Some of them also saw the bright, noisy, got the bright, noisy water. They don't seem ready to make the association between illness and bright, noisy water, but they they do seem to be ready to make the association between foot shock and light and noise, between physical harm and then these, yeah, these external stimuli like noise. That sort of makes sense that out there in the environment, if you get physically hurt, there was something out there that made noise. Now we're going to avoid that. 
So the water is like a conditioned, drinking the water is a, is a conditioned response that reflects what they've learned to fear. And this shows an influence of biological preparedness. Instincts can override learning. Animal trainers have found that animals can revert to instinctive behaviors. So the Berlans, where psychologists tried to train uh, pigs to put coins in piggy banks. And they could do that, except the pigs started like, instead of putting it in the piggy bank, uh, just rooting around and pushing the coin with their trunk. Because that's what pigs do with things. So their piggy behaviors overrode what they've learned. They also tried to teach raccoons to do this. And the raccoons started uh, rinsing their piggies. <laughs> Raccoons aren't really rinsing when they're doing that. They, um, they can feel better underwater. I think that's so they like to feel their food. So they, they didn't do what they were trained to do. They started reverting to their instinctive behavior. This also happens to lion tamers. It doesn't go so well for them. You can also learn cognitively. It's like the behaviorists discounted the importance of cognition. But you wouldn't be here if cognitive learning wasn't a thing, okay? And people who are put on like that, that drug to condition illness to alcohol, they, they know that they can just say, stop taking the drugs. So well, obviously cognition matters. When you learn cognitively as you walk around a building, you also learn by, through observation, right? You can watch what other people do. And if they're reinforced for it, you're more likely to do that yourself. That's particularly likely if you like the person as a person's high status, if you look up to them as an authority. This is why advertisers use celebrity endorsements. It's a famous experiment in social psychology called the Bobo doll experiment. And what briefly happened there is that Bandura put kids in a room with toys and an adult and the adult, in one condition got frustrated and went and punched this Bobo doll. And children who saw this happen when they were themselves frustrated, because the experiment was to them, and then the experiment went and watched what they, what they did, the ones who had seen the adult acting aggressively were more likely to act aggressively themselves to go and beat up and kick and punch the bow at all. The kids who hadn't seen that didn't do it. Something called mirror neurons. These are controversial, but there may be neurons that fire when you see someone else do something. And that might have a role in empathy. Many applications of observational learning, say in training and teaching, you go watch a tutorial or watching something happen to someone else. You try to model pro social behavior. Advertisers use celebrity endorsements. And unfortunately, a modeling can, can work in reverse. There's converging lines of evidence that violent media make people act, are more likely to act aggressively and less pro-socially. And abusive parents may have aggressive children because they've modeled aggression as a way of solving problems. Finally, have you guys heard about learning styles? Yeah, like maybe you're a you're a reader, you have like a, a visual learning style or auditory learning style. It's really prevalent in, in education. Is it true? No? Shrugging? It's a very attractive philosophy, but it fails hard at empirical tests. So studies on this will start out really, really positive, hoping that it's gonna work out, and then they get null results. So unfortunately, there is no good empirical evidence to say that you have a learning style and that you will learn better if you are presented information in a way that's compatible with your learning style. As we will learn when we talk about memory next class, the best way for you to remember something is to, to learn it in multiple different ways. That increases your chance of being able to.